We are live. Welcome back to Prophecy 3 DNA, where we discover, decrypt, demystify, and apply Bible prophecy from a biblical perspective. My name is Donnie Alvarenga, and I am honored to be on this journey with you along with my brother, Don DeCuna. Over the past several weeks, we have been demystifying and decrypting and discovering Bible prophecy from the lens of the Bible, allowing the Bible to interpret itself. And one big question that people always ask is, but hasn't God's law been changed? Okay, wasn't it nailed to the cross? And we've actually been diving into this because all of this, you know, Jesus dying on the cross, Jesus being the Messiah, all of this stuff is prophetic. Okay, it happened in Bible prophecy, and it's falling into the sequence as we di di dissect Bible prophecy. So the big question is, did the law change? Is the law changeable? And that's what we've been really, really exploring over the past couple of weeks, that there actually is more than just one law, right? And right now, we've been more specifically diving into the moral law. And so, Don, tell us a little bit more about what we're going to be learning today. Uh, I will, but can you go ahead and pray for us, please? Yes. So our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your mercy and grace and always pursuing us when we fail you over and over and over again, Lord. Please forgive us for the times that we forget. Please forgive us for the times that we um, we don't live up to our end of the bargain. Thank you so much for being faithful to your end of the bargain and for going above and beyond every single time. Join us now as we study your word so that we can learn to understand your heart and you better. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, so I just left up our, our methodology here. You can pause it and, and take a look a little bit longer if you'd like. Um, and But we're going to go ahead and, and head straight through it. So last week we were describing this concept of the moral law as the if of the if this then that. Okay, so there's a condition here. There's always a condition when it comes to the covenants, when it comes to God's law, and what happens there. So we describe this idea that there is a, you know, an everlasting, um, everlasting gospel, right? That it is this idea that we sinned against God. You know, God created us, we sinned against him, therefore it causes separation. Because of that separation, we need a, a remedy so we can reconcile with God. That remedy was Christ's death. And the belief in his death and his atoning sacrifice realigns us, atones us, reconciles us with the creator. That's the everlasting gospel in a nutshell. Okay, But there's these components. The moral law, the consequence for either accepting it or denying it. And then, you know, there's, there's a remedy for if you break it. Okay, So we're focusing now on the moral law and why it matters. Because... This is an interaction and this is a contractual relationship we have with our Redeemer, the living God, the Father, and the Creator. Okay? These are the, 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 the things that describe the first four elements of His commandments. Okay? The first four commandments link directly to this concept. So now we're going to go into the, the characteristics of God's moral law. So that we, we are also described in, in Romans, the two laws. There's one law that is the spirit of life in Christ. And another law that is the law of sin and death, the consequence for breaking the spirit of life in Christ. Okay, this is the spirit of life in Christ. <laughs> so, it is descriptive. The moral law provides the definition of what constitutes sin and how to remain in good standing and righteousness with God. That's all it does. The commandments cannot save you because they are only a description of good and bad behavior. Does that make sense? It's like... Uh, me looking at a posted 55 mile an hour uh, speeding sign. It can't save me. <laughs> Does that make sense? It just tells me that there's 55 miles per hour. It's descriptive. All right, so let's look at a couple of, of concepts here in scripture. So go ahead and, and read this. First John 3 verse 4 says, whoever practices sin breaks the law for sin is lawlessness. Okay, so this is the, the most practical definition of sin. If you break the law, that is sin. Okay, here's another one. Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. But I did not know sin except through the law. I would not have known coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So Paul is describing here that he's like, I have no idea what sin is. I have no idea what sin is. But the, 
law tells me what sin is. Does that make sense? He's like, I wouldn't have known coveting was a thing, except that the law said, thou shalt not covet. Does that make sense? So what is the law actually telling us? It's a description of behavior. That's all it is. Here's another one. James 2, verse 9 through 10. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as sinners. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of breaking the whole law. So again, it's a descriptive characteristics. The law gives you a set of rules if it can't save you from the consequences of breaking those rules. Does that make sense? It just tells you what is right and what is wrong. Okay? So... It's descriptive. Next, it's a mirror. And a mirror to what? So it's a comparison to God's very own character and standard of judgment. Two things. Remember, we've described this concept of God's name. God's name is love and justice. Right? So the law describes his love and his justice. All right? So it's a mirror. It's something that when we look at it, we either align with it or we don't right so we're either looking into a mirror and see ourselves or we look into a mirror and see god does that make sense so let's see if that's the case also so here's a couple more uh verses that describe this concept of a reflection go ahead James 1, to 25, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man viewing his natural face in a mirror. He views himself and goes his way and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in his deeds. Okay, so describe to me how you understand this, what James is saying here. I think that it means that you become changed by beholding, right? Um, so by when we look in the mirror and we see what we are and we go off and we just do whatever we do, we just reflect what we are. However, what he's saying is um, when we observe and we look into the, to the law as a mirror, right? What ends up happening when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we reflect ourselves and there's no transformation that happens. When we look at the law as a mirror, then there is a tr there's the possibility of a transformation happening. There's, it doesn't necessarily happen, but it, there's a possibility of a transformation happening when we look at the law as a mirror, because then we're going to be reflecting what that says. The way we reflect it is by doing what it says. Yep. So let's put it this way. Um, let's say you were going to meet with some clients and you had a giant piece of like you know, bean or something stuck in the middle of your teeth. So it looks like you have a gap teeth when you really don't. And you're talking to your friends the whole time and they're looking at you kind of weird. But they don't tell you anything. And then you get in your car and you look in the rearview mirror because you're looking back and somehow you spot this thing in your teeth. Did the mirror save you from that? The embarrassment you just had? No. But it did show you you had something in your teeth. So that's what this, this is describing to me. Okay, I think what you said was great. I'm just giving a different analogy. The mirror only tells you your own state. That's all it does. It can't save you. It can't do anything. All it can do is tell you this is what you look like. After that, we have to decide whether we remove something from our teeth. Does that make sense? So, we'll go ahead and read this. When also, this is in James as well. James 2, verse 8 through 12. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as sinners. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of breaking the whole law. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if you do not commit adultery, yet you kill, you become a lawbreaker. Okay. And, and then read verse 12. Oh, so, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So what law is he describing here? Is he talking about circumcision? Is he talking about feasts? Is he talking? What is he talking about here? The law that says to not commit adultery. Correct. Or don't the kill. The law that says do not kill. Exactly. So this is what James is talking about here. 
So what is he describing as what is God's standard of judgment? The law of liberty. The law of liberty. So the law does not save us, but the law can do what? Convict us. Does that make sense? So it's this concept of God has to, for God to have a government, he has to have rules. If you don't have rules, what is it called in a society? Anarchy. Anarchy. God is a God of, of pr everything is right and proper in its place. Right? He even makes laws in nature like the laws of physics. Right? We don't have reverse gravity. We don't have people floating off into the stratosphere. Right? So he even designs these laws for, for, that govern science and nature. So how can we, as, as his created beings, decide that now all of a sudden these laws don't really exist? So what is God saying here through James? He's saying, the standard of judgment that I employ is how you match up to this law. Does that make sense? So the law cannot save us ever, but it sure can convict us. All right. So when we describe this concept of salvation by grace, grace is what saves us, but sin is what loses us. And if we continue in sin, you know, there's, there's a, a, a later on in Hebrews, it says, you know, if you continue in sin, how can salvation even affect you? Because you continue to live in that sinful nature. Does that make sense? It's like, uh, I always like giving the analogy of if I'm drowning in the ocean and somebody comes up and throws a life ring at me. If I grab that life ring and I throw it back at them, they're trying to save me. Does that make sense? They're like, I'm trying to save you, dude. But you don't want what I'm offering you. Does that make sense? And this is exactly what happens. Yep. This is exactly, I mean, what you just said is exactly what happens. And I know that it drives me crazy. I actually, I was having a conversation with my dad recently talking about, you know, us wanting to help others, you know, and them saying, nope, don't need your help. Don't want your help. And for somebody that wants to help, like I do, that's like painful. Yeah. I'm like, I don't understand. Do you see that you're drowning? I just threw you a life vest. And yet that's what they do. They throw it back. And and God does that for us every single day. And we throw it back at him every single day. And, and it's just interesting because what my dad shared with me and has been such a powerful life lesson for me is that um, not even Jesus can help those that don't want help. And that's essentially what this whole thing, the whole plan of salvation is, is the fact that he is throwing the life vest out and saying, here, just take it. You know, my blood will cover you. Yes. Yes. And when your blood, his blood covers us, then we can appreciate it's not saving. What saves us is not the law. It's the life vest. The life vest saves us, but we must hold on to the life vest. And then when we, once we get onto the boat, we can't jump off the boat again. Yep. <laughs> you know? It's like, but that's what we do. Yep. hundred percent. So here's another one describing this mirror. And this is a Paul in Corinthians. So go ahead and read this one. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18, seeing that we have such hope, we speak with great boldness, not as Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Instead, their minds was their minds were blinded for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the old covenant, the veil which was done away with in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is in their hearts. Nevertheless, when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all seeing the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces as in a mirror are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the spirit of the Lord. So basically, what is the law trying to do? Right here, actually, what is it trying to do? What is this mirror trying to do? It's trying to transform us. It's trying to transform form us. So he's described, Paul's describing this concept of when Moses spent all this time with God, he came back and his face was glowing. So the people said, put a veil over your face because we can't be in your presence. It's too bright, right? But what Paul's saying here, your face should be bright. Your face should be bright. But the people of Israel, right? When they saw the law of God, they would prefer to have that veil over the face. 
right? So what is Paul saying here? Let the light shine. So wait a minute. Go for Isn't it. Isn't Paul saying that the covenant was done away with? Isn't that what that's saying? So what it's saying here is that, let's, let's read this again. Their minds were blinded. Why were their minds blinded? Okay. Because even to that day, so Paul's describing that even in his day, the people that are under the old covenant, they still have a veil that is unlifted in the reading of the old covenant. So how are so, they looking at the mirror? Are they looking at the mirror or are they looking at the, a veil? A veil. They're looking at a veil. Now, what So what he's saying is, remove the veil and look at yourself. Are you glowing? You're not glowing. So glow. How do you glow? You do what the mirror tells you to do, like remove the thing from your teeth. Like get the boogers out of your eyes. Like you have a eyelash, an errant eyelash or eyebrow that's kind of going off janky. Right? That's what the law is telling you to. And who now, enables us to do that? The Spirit of God. Because if we look in the mirror and we've given up on life, do we care if there, our hair is all disheveled? Do we care if we got boogers in our eyes? Do we care if we got morning drool on our lips? I'm good. I, in fact, I'd rather put the veil back on so that way I don't have to see my own ugliness. Does that make sense? So that's what it's so describing. when was it that here. Moses was glowing? It was when he spent 40 days with God. And when he got... The Ten the Commandments. Correct. And so he absorbed the image of God. Does that make sense? He absorbed the image of God. So what Paul is saying here is, don't veil your face. Look in the mirror and see what's wrong with yourself. And be transformed into that same image that the mirror should be reflecting. Does that make sense? And who does the transforming? Is it us? By the Spirit of the Lord. Okay. So I think this is where a lot of people really struggle with the law is they feel like they can't do it. No, you can't. On your own, you can't. And God doesn't expect us to. He expects us to just observe the mirror, look at the mirror, and then allow in a spirit of surrender for the spirit to do the work. Correct. Because when we look at the law, it makes us uncomfortable. What is that thing that is making us uncomfortable? The fact that we don't measure up. And who is telling you to feel uncomfortable? The spirit. If I embezzle funds from my company and I look at the Bible and it says, thou shalt not steal. I'm going to either feel nothing or I'm going to feel that, mm, should I not, I, I shouldn't be doing this. That I shouldn't be doing this is the spirit telling you you shouldn't be doing that. Does that make sense? Yes. But I think that there's, go ahead. I think that there's something that we need to understand as well is that you mentioned that we don't want to look at the law because it doesn't feel good. Okay. And that not feeling good can be one of two spirits, I believe. Okay. It can be the spirit of the Lord tugging on our hearts to say, let's change. Or it can also be the spirit of the enemy saying, see, you're not worthy. That is true. Okay. That and is this is where understanding that the blood of Jesus covers that and believing that and then boldly throwing that back in the enemy's face. Okay. So there's that discomfort that, that allows us to transform, but then there's also a discomfort that makes us want to put the veil on. Correct. Okay. And so there's, there's, there's guilt and there's shame. And I don't believe that God is a God of, of shame. He's Whoa. a God that will show us what needs to be fixed. Okay. Yep. And if we, in a spirit of surrender, allow the spirit to draw us and say, look, and I, I've been caught in situations where I did not know. I did not know that something I was doing was wrong. And when it was brought to my attention, I thought, Oh, yep. I didn't realize that. Yep. And it made me feel terrible. And yet what I love about 
God's mercy and grace is that when he shows us what we're doing wrong and we're like, oh my goodness, that, that makes me feel terrible. He says, okay, go and sin no more. That's what he says. He doesn't keep harping on it. He, pour, he covers us with our, his blood. And this is why it's so important that we understand the sacrificial system is simply because he covers us with his blood and he says, go and sin no more. Yep. So let me just bring back a, a thing to what you said about feeling that guilt and shame. Here's something that's right in the dead middle of this passage. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we now have that freedom to say, you know what, Lord, I'm not worthy. But because I've surrendered to you, I know that you've saved me. So the devil's going to tell us, put the veil back on because you're not worthy. But the other piece of it, what he's going to do is, you know, we can also look at that law and be like, oh, I don't like that it's telling me this. So now I'm going to put the veil back on. Right? I like my eye boogers. I like my crazy eyebrows. Right? So I want to know that it's wrong. <laughs> I don't want anyone to tell me that I'm wrong. Because it's so hard as human beings to be proved wrong. I'm just as guilty as the next person. But what is God saying here? This is my standard. It's my standard of behavior and it's my standard of judgment. In the end, what is going to be the standard that we're judged by? The law of liberty, right? So let's just keep reading here and, and we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the next item. First John two, verse three through six, by this, we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, whoever says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word truly has the love of God perfected in him. By this, we know we are in him. Whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as he walked. So the ultimate thing is this. Those who remain in him ought to walk as he walked. We should be, as God said in the beginning, made in his image. Does that make sense? So when we look in that mirror, it's God that is seen, not us. It's Christ because of his sacrifice. But if we continue to do what we're doing, how could we possibly reflect that sacrifice? Does that make sense? So it's a mirror. Next. Obedience to God is better than sacrifices and offerings. This is something that Jesus himself said. So if you remain faithful to his law and you remain faithful to his moral code, meaning you love God and you love each other, you're not hurting God, you're not hurting each other. That is so much better than having to continually bring a new sacrifice and asking for forgiveness. Does that make sense? So let's look at a couple of texts that describe this concept. So the first one's in Samuel. And this is a description that when Samuel was talking to King Saul, because King Saul kept screwing up left and right, left and right. And then Saul, Samuel was speaking to Saul and he's like, look, dude. Let me, let me give you the gist of, of what it is to have this interaction with God between his mercy and his forgiveness. Okay? I, you, you seem that you don't understand it, so I'm going to give it to you as blunt as possible. So here's what Sam, Samuel says. Go ahead. For Samuel 15, to 23, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Obedience is better than sacrifice, a listening ear than the fat of rams. For rebellion as is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So what is he saying here? Rebellion, meaning obstinance, meaning I refuse to submit to you and your word, in God's eyes is as bad as witchcraft. So I know this is an example that is not as bad as witchcraft, but I just want to throw okay. it out there because I think sure. it may help us understand, you know, um, I am a former, former nurse practitioner and as a nurse practitioner, drug reps would come to us and tell us about, you know, try to sell us drugs and, you know, <laughs> try to sell us drugs, try to get us to use drugs to use on people. And, um, there, there was one that came to talk about some cholesterol medication that you sprinkle on the food. And therefore you can eat whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want. Just sprinkle this on the food and it goes away. Okay. 
But the truth is that if you eat whatever you want, that medication might keep your cholesterol from going up, but you're going to experience all the other consequences of eating whatever it is that you want. Okay. And that's really what I think in a Saul situation, I'm assuming from that verse that what Saul would do is he would do something wrong, knowing it was wrong, but he's like, I can cover it with a sacrifice. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to cover it with a sacrifice. And Samuel's like, no, 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 no. This is not the way it works. There is no magic sprinkle that you could put over the wrong that you're doing that's going to make it right with God. That's presumption. So ultimately what we want to do or what God asks of us is if we know that it's right, that we do what is right. Right. And not that just we don't want to know so that we don't have to do what's right. He just says, if you know what's right, then do what's right because it's only good for you and for everybody else. And this is how people will know that you know me. This is how I will be glorified is when you obey the thing. And there's also the idea. So I'll, I'll bring the embezzling funds scenario again. If I decide I want to continue embezzling funds, but then I go and I take that money and I give it some of it to the church. And then I... Uh, go immediately and say, Lord, please forgive me for embezzling the fun these funds. Uh, you know, I I'm sorry. I, I throw myself at your mercy. And then the very next day, I go back and embezzle those funds again and embezzle new funds and then go back and keep asking for forgiveness. Samuel's saying that does not work. That's what he's saying. And the ultimate result is this. Because he rejected the word of the Lord, he God rejects him. So what's the most important thing? Obedience and a listening ear. Obedience. Because if you obey, there's no need for the sacrifice. There's no need for forgiveness. Does that make sense? But what's really cool is that God did give us a plan B. If we do, like I have Correct. in the past, done something that I didn't realize, Correct. right? And when we do come with that repentant heart, with that genuine heart that says, oh, I didn't know I was wrong, you know, or, oh my goodness, I, I, I messed up, right? Like from a genuine place, God has given us a way in his mercy. Correct. So let's keep reading here. And this is David in, in, in one of his Psalms. Psalm 40, verse six through eight, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. You have opened up my ears to listen. Burnt, off, burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my inward parts. So if we love to do God's will, and here we can see in Hebrew parallelism, God's will is synonymous with his law. Okay. So he loves doing God's will because his laws in his, in his inward parts. So he understands what does God really want? Opened ears to hear and do. Does that make sense? Here's another one in Psalms. Psalm 51, 16 through 17, for you do not desire sacrifice or I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So they're pretty succinct there. Right? What does God want? A contrite heart. You mentioned the word before repentance. What is the essence of repentance? You turn from what you were doing. Contrition. To have that true spiritual remorse. And that spiritual remorse, I'm not talking about shame. I'm talking about remorse. Like when I hurt my son's feeling. Like when I hurt my wife's feelings. Does that make sense? Because I've done things to do both. And my daughter, I'm sure I've, I've hurt, I'm pretty sure I've hurt your feelings. But in the end, what do I have to do? I have to have the humility to look at, you know, look at God and look at myself in that mirror and be like, I am not measuring up. Please forgive me. And I don't want to continue doing this thing that hurt you. Okay. So those are Psalms. Here's another one in, in Ecclesiastes now. So this is, um, this is his son. This is Solomon. Go ahead and read this. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1. Guard your steps when you enter the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they are doing evil. So it's a sacrifice of fools to continue doing the sacrifice. 
You're wasting your time. You're wasting God's time. Because if you're and just this gonna, is the thing ahead. is that the sacrifices were only required as a covering for sin, right? And so therefore, what he's saying is it's a sacrifice of fools to continue doing the thing that requires the sacrifice. Yep. And here's one from Isaiah that I think nails it pretty, pretty hard. So go ahead and, and read this uh, in Isaiah. Isaiah 1, 11 through 17. For what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed animals. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of male goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to trample your courts, to trample my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations I cannot bear with evil assemblies. My soul hates your new moons and your appointed feasts. They are a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you reach out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even when you make my prayer, many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil from your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the will widow. So here's some things that's interesting. So here he gives the remedy, right? He says, this is your state, but here's the remedy. Go clean the boogers out of your eyes. Wash yourself. Put away the evil from your deeds, right? These are the ways that we actually can have a relationship. Here's something else that's interesting because he, he mentions things that the Bible tells us we need to do for that reconciliation with God. The new moons was a feast. This term Sabbaths is not the Sabbath we think of as the Sabbath day, the weekly one. It's talking about those, those ceremonial Sabbaths, okay, in convocations. How does he describe these things? Your sure. new moons your appointed feasts because they're no longer doing it for God. They're doing it for what? To appease their own selfish desires and say, these things will cleanse me from doing what I need to do. And all I got to do is wait another month or two and I can do another one. It's or the cholesterol sprinkle. It's the cholesterol sprinkle. Okay. Here's, uh, here's one in Hosea. Hosea 6, verse 6 through 7, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But like men, they have transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. So I've actually had conversations with other Christians, and they love using this verse right here to justify the concept that we don't have to keep God's law. Because they say, see, God just desires mercy and not sacrifice. So you're, being, you're saying you're being saved by, by keeping the commandments. Like, no. You need to read one more verse to see what it says. But like men, they have transgressed the covenant and dealt faith, faith, faithlessly with me. All you have to read is one verse later to understand the true concept of what God is describing here regarding his covenant. He's saying, don't do these sacrifices because the knowledge of God is worth more than these things. And that knowledge of God is what? His covenant. But instead, what do we choose to do? Deal faithlessly with him. What does it mean? We are unfaithful to him. How does God see this unfaithfulness? You're not keeping his word. Does that make sense? So even in this verse that people use plenty of times in Hosea, they're missing a lot if they just don't read one extra verse. So we have to, that's one of the reasons why we try to describe the context of things. Right? And I encourage everyone to read the entire chapter 6 of Hosea. Because the entire chapter 6 of Hosea, this is in the middle. <laughs> so there's a lot more meat on that bone that's talking about how the children of Israel were acting a certain way. And God was saying, because you're acting this way, I cannot keep doing this. We're gonna, it's a cycle, guys. You sin, I forgive. You sin, I forgive. You sin, I forgive. You sin, I forgive. Why don't you just try this? Don't sin. So I don't need to forgive. And we broke the cycle. That's all we need to do. You stop sinning. I, I don't need to forgive. I will continue to forgive you until what? We describe what? A probationary period. There's an infinite amount of forgiveness until that threshold is crossed. 
When that threshold is crossed, God says, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. And that is scriptural. So now let's look at some of the places in the New Testament that describe this. This is Jesus speaking in Matthew. Matthew 9, verse 13, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So this is an even better thing that what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus calling every single one? Because we're all sinners, right? What is calling every single sinner in the world to do? To turn around and stop sinning. And Which is exactly what he said to Mary. Go and sin no more, right? Correct. So here he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He's saying, you don't understand this. Because he says, go learn. Go learn what it means. You don't understand what this means. You don't get it. What is the essence of this? That word right there. Repentance. So a lot of people will be like, well, Jesus doesn't care. I'm saved now because of grace. Have you repented? What is that? Ah, Jesus says, I came to call the sinners to repentance. Does that make sense? I came to call the sinners to repentance. What does repentance mean? I no longer continue living the life I did before. Does that make sense? I stop. I, I stop and, desist. and I turn around and I start. I was heading away from God. I am now heading towards God. Does that make sense? Here's another one. He says it again. Matthew 12, verse 7, if you had known what this meant, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would, have not, you would not have condemned the innocent. Here's another one. Mark 12, 32 through 34, the scribe said to him, well said, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth that there is one God and there is no other but him. To love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw the that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. So this is Jesus giving a commendation to this guy. Because when Jesus, they asked him, what's the greatest commandment? God said, love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So this guy says, this guy knows what's, he's like, he, about Jesus, he's like, this guy knows what's up. Not only that, I'm going to expound on what Jesus said, Right? To love him with all your heart is what part of the Ten Commandments? The first four. To love your neighbor as yourself is what? The, the se second six. The second six. And that is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. So what is it that is better than offerings and sacrifices? Is it offering God, like Cain, what we think he deserves? Or is it offering to God what he's asking for? Does that make sense? It's, I, I don't know that with Cain, it was what he thought God deserved. It's what he, he wanted to give. Sure. And so it's the idea of what does he, what do it, does God ask us to give him what we want? Or does he ask us to give him what he wants? Correct. Yeah, you said that better than I could. So here's another one that, that, this will finish off here with Hebrews and at 10, uh, 4 through 10. So go ahead and read this. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have had no pleasure. Then I said, See, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the volume of the book. Previously, when he said you did not desire sacrifices and offerings, you... Previously, when he said, you did not desire sacrifices and offerings. You have had no pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, which are offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, see, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So here's a couple of things. I have come to do your will. I have come to do your will. By this will we have been sacrificed. What did we look at? What is God's will? Your law. His law. This is what Paul is referencing. This verse that Jesus also said. Will 
is the synonym of his law. So in Hebrews, this isn't me making it up. I delight to do your will, O my God, your laws within my inward parts. Psalms 40, verses 6 through 8. I'm going to do something interesting here. You see how there is little asterisks here? Mm -hmm. What is it referencing? That same Psalms verse. 46 through 8. That same verse. So in Hebrew parallelism, what is it saying here? I have come to do your law, O God. He takes away the first that he establishes the second. By this law, we have been sanctified. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we see that this is the moral law, that obedience to it is better than continued asking for forgiveness and sacrifice and all this other nonsense. Does that make sense? It's interesting that it talks about doing God's will, not sacrifices. Which suggests to me that those two are not necessarily the same. Correct. God's will, not sacrifices. God's law, not sacrifices. So those two things are not the same. Just wanted to highlight that. Correct. So next, circumcision is not required to keep God's law. Period. You don't have to be circumcised to keep God's law. And we're going to look at some certain texts. You may be asking, why is that the case? Why I bring it up? Because for the ceremonial systems, circumcision is required. It is required, and we'll study that. But to actually keep God's law, there's no requirement for anybody. So go ahead and read this. In, in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God is everything. So this is Paul. And a lot of people say, well, Paul's the one that said that the Ten Commandments are done away with. But yet he says this. So either our understanding of this is wrong or our understanding of the, of the former is wrong. Does that make sense? So it kind of goes back to what I was just saying is that there's two separate things. There's the sacrifices and the ceremonies and there's the law. Two separate things. Yep. Here's another one why why the, the circumcision thing is a non-issue. When we look at the fourth commandment, he says, who is the fourth commandment for? In fact, let's just bring it up here. Um, just just so we can we can look at it. And I'm not, you know, nobody's saying that I'm talking out of turn. So who's the, the, the Sabbath commandment for? Remember the, Remember Sabbath, the day? Sabbath day and keep it holy. Go ahead. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, so here, who's it for? God. Sure, but who is it else for? Our daughters. Can our daughters be circumcised? No. Our male servants, and think about it in the Hebrew perspective, does their male servant have to be a Jew or can they be a foreigner? Is there any expectation that that person would have to be circumcised? No. How about here? You're going to go out there and circumcise your livestock? No. How about your guests? Does that make sense? There's no need for a circumcision. This doesn't make too much sense to you now, but it will when I bring it in the context of the other ones. But just understand that it's not a requirement. Okay? Well, it just goes back to it's different. There is the moral law. And there is sacrifices and ceremonies that were actually spelt out by God that we're going to be studying. Okay? But the truth is, is that there's two separate things. Correct. And that's what we need to understand. Correct. It was given before sin. It is described as over everlasting, which means it has always been. And we've gone over these texts in the Old Testament and the New. We had a video where we, we showed in the Old Testament and the New how God's everlasting covenant or everlasting law in the Old Covenant and in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So here, just to show you, in the past, before Sinai, there is over 46. It's just 46 because those are the ones I found. And I'm sure I haven't found all of them. This is before the desert. This is before God spoke, giving the Ten Commandments. Okay? 46 representations of sin and breaking specific laws like thou shalt not kill, uh, abusing the Sabbath, 
uh, taking someone's God's name in vain. Okay. 46 times. After the cross, it's described over 99 times in the New Testament. Same ideas. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet. Honor your parents. Keep my Sabbath. No other gods. So, it was given before the commandments. And here's some ideas as to why it was given before the Ten Commandments. Before Sinai, so, right? Before Sinai. So, this is a description of Lucifer in heaven. This is before Sinai, is it not? Okay, so go ahead and read this. Ezekiel 28, 13 through 19. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every pre precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub that covers, and I set you there. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before kings that they may see you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trade. So just, just stop there. So this is a description of the devil in heaven. So Lu Lucifer in heaven. Okay. What? What happened there in heaven? Iniquity. And he what? Sinned. What is his great sin? Let's read this. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who are who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will, will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. First commandment, second commandment, third commandment, fourth commandment broken. Just, just by that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is before the creation of the world. All right. Before the creation of the world, was there sin before the creation of the world? How could there be sin if there was no law? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Jesus describes seeing Leighton, Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Right? Here's another one in Genesis. This is describing the fall. Go ahead and read this. Genesis 2, 15 through 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Okay, so what was the consequence if they did this thing God told them not to do? Die. Die. All right. Read this. Genesis 3, 4 through 7. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall surely will not die for god knows that on the day you eat of it your eyes will be open and you will be like god knowing good and evil when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasing to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise she took of its fruit and ate and she gave to her husband with her and he ate then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves okay so did they sin yes Here's something interesting also I'm going to bring up in Genesis 4, which is the story of Cain and Abel. This is the in interaction between God and Cain before he killed his brother. Go ahead and read that and highlight it in blue. But for Cain and for his offering, he did not have respect, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to dominate you, but you must rule over it. So what is crouching at the door? Sin. So did sin exist during the time of Cain and Abel? Okay. Is this before Sinai? Yes. So did God's law exist before Sinai? Yes. 
Okay. The word ever everlasting. A long duration from antiquity to futurity. Forever and everlasting. Perpetual old and ahead. It has always been, and this is in the New Testament, without beginning and without end. So God's law, this moral law, has been there since eternity past through eternity future. Is this law still going to be applicable when we go to heaven? Mm -hmm. Yes. Still applicable. Doesn't go away. So unless... When we go to heaven, we won't be able to kill somebody. So unless... Unless from eternity past to the cross, God kept his law. Then Jesus died. Then he does away with his law. And then he comes again and his law is once again instituted. We're talking about a 2,000, let's say 3,000 year period of time. Throughout all of history, eternity past and eternity future, there's a gap there where he says, well, in this time, my law is not going to matter anymore. Does that make any sense? When we when we read scripture and we see that the you know when God says I am the Lord I change not. That's what we're actually that's what our denominations are teaching us. That's what our religions are teaching us. They're teaching us that for eternity past until the cross his law mattered. It doesn't matter now, but when he comes again it will matter once more. Just this time, God's saying, you know what? I'm okay with this period of time throughout all of history to say, mm, no, we're, we don't need it anymore. It does not jive. It doesn't jive with scripture. That's what I can tell you. Go on to the next one. It is binding on humanity until the end of time. Not Jews. Not just the Jews. Not just Hebrews. Okay? Binding on humanity until the end of time. Let's look at some texts that describe this. So go ahead and, and read this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. Now all has been heard. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So this word man is the word Adam, which is the word Adam. The word Adam means humanity. I don't know if you knew that. That's what it means. So... Fearing God and keeping his commandments is for the whole duty of who? Man. Did that say Jew? Did that say uh, Muslim? Did that say Chinese? Brazilian? No. Humanity. The whole duty of humanity. Why? Because God will bring every deed into judgment. He said that. I'm gonna, I have a standard of judgment. And what is my standard of judgment? My commandments. Okay, here's another one. Psalm 111, 7 through 9. The works of his hands are true and just. All his commands are sure. They stand forever and ever. They are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and fearful is his name. So how long is God's commandment for? Forever. And ever. Okay, here's another one. Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or one mark will pass from the law until all be fulfilled. You know who said that? Jesus. Jesus. So has all been fulfilled yet? No. Is heaven and earth still here? Yep. So is his law still in, in play? Yes. Okay. Here's in, in Revelation. This is something called the first angel's message. Go ahead and read this. Revelation 14, 6 through 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the eternal gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. He said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. Okay. Who's supposed to receive this message? Every nation, tribe, and tongue, and people. Is that Hebrews? Is that Jews? Is that Christians? Mm -mm. Everybody. Everybody. Okay. Here at the end of time, 
is who the devil is the most angry with. This is who he's always persecuting. He, here is who he's always chasing. So if he's always chasing up into the end of time, we should take heed as to why he is chasing them. This is still future events. Okay, so go ahead and read this. Revelation 12, verse 17, Then the dragon was angry with the woman, and he went to wage war with the remnant of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what is the characteristics of God's end-time people? Those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. So is are God's commandments still applicable now and through into the future? Mm -hmm. Here's another one. Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is the bookend. This is the bookend of the chiasm of the first angel's message that we just read. Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. See right here, Revelation 14? Mm -hmm. Revelation 14. So when we look at the chiasm of the three angels' message, one says keep the commandments, or it's, one says fear God. The other one says, keep the commandments. What did Solomon say in Ecclesiastes? Fear God, Fear God and keep his commandments. We see how there's this, it's synchronized between the Old Testament and the New. What does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to revere God in such a huge way that you don't want to disappoint him? It goes back to, it's not what I want, it's what he wants. Correct. So here's another one in Revelation, and then we got two more, and then we'll finish off that, 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 that thought. Revelation 22, 14, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So who can partake of the tree of life and enter into the new Jerusalem? Those who do his commandments. Correct. What about here? Revelation 19, 10, I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what are the key components of God's end time human beings, regardless of denomination, okay, that the devil's trying to, you know, go against, but God is trying to protect those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus. Does that make sense? It'll make a lot even more sense when we go through and we study the covenant. Okay. So is it binding on humanity? Mm -hmm. Yes. God spoke from a mountain and it was witnessed by his people. We've covered this in many times and in, in, the, in, the, in the interest of saving time, please read Exodus 19 and 20, where we described how God came down on the mountain and he spoke it. I'll just bring up one verse here just to show you the very beginning of it. Go ahead and just read that in blue. Exodus 20 verse now, 1. Now God spoke all these words saying. Okay. And then I'm going to show another one right here. Go ahead and read that. All the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. So God spoke this from a mountain in the hearing of his people. He wrote it with his own finger on tables of stone. And this is what we were talking about earlier with the whole veiling. So go ahead and read this because this, this ties into that story. So go ahead. Exodus 24 verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel and under his feet was, was something like a paved work of sapphire stone as clear as the sky itself. Good. Exodus 24 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me to the mountain and stay there. And I will give you the stone tablets with law and the commandments, which I have written so that you may teach them. Okay. So the stone tablets had what? The, the law. law. And who wrote it? God. Go ahead and read this. Exodus 31, verse 18. When he had made an end of communing with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Read that again, please. Written with the finger of God. Read that. Exodus 30, 32, 15 through 16. Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand. 
The tablets were written on both their sides. They were written on one side and on the other. The tablets were God's work and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. So here's something that's interesting and it's something that I learned. And, and if I can find uh, where I had read it, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up again. But it's interesting here that it says it was written on one side and on the other. Back in, in the Hebrew times, uh, in these ancient times, whenever people made a, a contract between each other, they would write it on both sides. So then that way, when one person was reading it, the other person could read it also from the other side. So that way, nothing is being, there's no, no shadiness. So now, you know, we see like things like when the president signs, there's somebody over his shoulder, right? They're, you know, like everybody's clapping, president signing something, everybody's standing behind him, right? This was something that it's like, this is our contract. I'm looking at the same thing you are, but you're in front of me. Does that make sense? So if you see th anything wrong, I can just look over to the side and say, do you see anything wrong with this contract? That's how they used to write them. So God wrote this as well. So he's looking at one side of the mirror while he's also forcing you to look at that side of the mirror. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And what you see should reflect on both sides. But the, it, it got destroyed, right? Right here, it describes how Moses threw it down. What did God do when Moses destroyed the other ones? Go ahead and read this. Exodus 34, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, cut out for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Okay. So who also wrote it on the second one? God. Okay. Go ahead and read that. Exodus 34, verse 4. So he cut out two tablets of stone like the first, and Moses rose, rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, just as the Lord had commanded him. And took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Right. 34, 28 through, through 29. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Okay, so what are the words of the covenant that he God wrote himself? The Ten Commandments. Okay. And then the last one here, Moses came down from Sinai with the two tablets in his hands. And when he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. As he talked with him, just as we said before, that veil that they had to put on him. Okay. So do you think God cares if he took the effort to do it twice? Yes, he did it himself. Where is that placed? Where are these commandments placed? Inside the Ark of the Covenant. So go ahead and read that. Exodus 40, verse 20 through 21. He took the testimony and put it into the Ark attached the poles to the ark and put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screening and screened the ark of the testimony, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So we described it once with God's ark and his character. You know, we went through all the different furniture, uh, items of furniture in the sanctuary and the ark. And I try to describe this concept of what's more important, the box or what's inside of the box. So I have a safe. It's a fireproof safe. What do I put inside my fireproof safe? Birth certificates, marriage certificate, vehicle titles. Does that make sense? Things that are important go inside the box. Do I care if the box itself catches fire? No. In fact, it's designed to shield the things that are inside of the box. So what's more important to God? The box of the Ark of the Covenant or what's inside the Ark of the Covenant? Does that make sense? What's inside? What's inside? It is a testimony of God's character. Right? And what is that testimony? I had it once before. I'm going to try to pull it up now. But it is, describes the 10 things. Here we go. Or the things that are representative of God's testimony, character. This is what his commandments describe. This is what his moral law described. God is just. His law is just. God is truth. His law is truth. God is pure, pure, light, light, faithful to the end, even everlasting. We've covered this before. So what does it describe? God's character. So what have we learned today about God's moral law? What does it actually mean? What does it represent? What are some, some of the things you can remember off the top of your head that it represents? 
Well, first of all, I, what I learned about God's law is the fact that it is, it was not initiated at Sinai. It, it was initiated way before that. And Jesus said that he did not come to abolish that law. He came to establish it and he came to call people to repentance, which is in other words, call people to follow that law. Right. So that's one thing that I learned. Okay. So you learned that it was in eternity past and it's still valid in the present and it's in eternity future, unless we decide that the present doesn't matter. Okay. Also that sacrifice, you know, God doesn't care about sacrifices. That's not what his, his heart is. And so it really just drives home the point that, um, sacrifices and law, because it's very clearly clear that the law is important to God. The law is so important to God that he sent his son to die. Because there was a requirement for that atonement that we've been talking about, right? And Jesus himself said, if there is any other way, and there was no other way, he had to die, okay? And so that means it is unchangeable. Yep. Just as God. He changes not. He can't change his law either, right? So can you close in prayer for us, please? Yes. Thank you. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your justice and thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you so much for your love and thank you so much for allowing us to learn more about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Bye-bye. Right,